What if I told you that the common denominator of success does not rest upon abilities, timing, who you know, or how much money you have to contribute to the effort? Many people have had all of those benefits and have succeeded. Some have even had those benefits and failed. So what is the common denominator of success? Simply stated, the common denominator of success is this. The successful person does what failures don't like to do. Well, what do failures not want to do? I jotted down a couple of notes to contribute to our thoughts along this way. Failures don't like to work hard, especially when times are difficult. They don't like to persevere in difficulty when trials come their way, and trials will come on the path road to success. And along the way, there are those friends and family members who want to discourage us, thinking they are being a help, but in actuality, they are discouraging us from our efforts. Yes, failures suffer from the fatigue that comes from hard work, from encountering trials and difficulties along the way, and from resisting those who, in their efforts trying to help us, really discourage us. These same issues arise in our day-to-day, confronting Christians and the Christian congregation. Throughout our world today, it has become increasingly difficult to take a stand as a Christian. Someone has once said, a dear friend of mine said, the Christian life isn't easy, it's impossible, it's difficult, it's hard, and the whole world conspires against us. Today we face worldwide trials and temptations against Christians. There are people throughout the world who suffer from persecution and difficulty, even imprisonment. Hardship confronts the Christian congregation throughout every corner of the world. The Lord Jesus wrote a letter to some believers in a city called Smyrna, and he confronted these very issues and encouraged them as they faced hardship and difficulty in their lives. We find that letter recorded for us in Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. I'll read those verses in a moment because they contribute to how we as believers in Christ can face and endure under difficulties and hardships that we encounter every day. We start, first of all, at the At the very beginning of this letter that Christ wrote to his friends at Smyrna, he starts out with a revelation of himself. And we read that in verse number 8 of Revelation chapter 2. And I'll read it to you from my scriptures here. And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write these things. These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works and your tribulation. Jesus wanted his believers in the city of Smyrna to understand some things about himself. And he reveals to us his nature in these brief little words found in verse number 8 and the beginning of number 9. In verse number 8 we see, he says, I am the first and the last. (laughs) He's eternal. Jesus Christ is deity. He is God in the flesh, and he has eternity in his life. He is deity, he is God. We read also that he was dead and is alive, which reveals to us, as the scriptures reveal throughout them in the New Testament as well as the Old Testament, that Jesus Christ is the Savior, the serpent slayer promised in Genesis chapter 3. Jesus is the Savior. He was dead, dying on behalf of people other than himself, and is alive. He came alive again from the dead. And the scriptures confirm that as we read in the Gospels, and historians record for us. And we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the wonderful news of the resurrection of Christ. So we read very quickly in verse number 8, a number of features and characteristics of the nature of Christ. He is deity. He's the first and the last. He's eternal without beginning and without end. He's the Savior. And also his resurrection proves to us that one day he will be the judge over all the earth, 
over everyone from the beginning of history till the end of it. Scriptures tell us that because of his resurrection from the dead, that was the proof that he will be the judge of all people at the end of ages. And then he says at the beginning of verse number 9, he says, I know. And he reads the section. He says, I know. I know your works. And I understand what's going on in your tribulation and difficulties. That records for us the omniscience of God. He knows all things. Nothing happens or comes into your life or into my life that he doesn't know. He is omniscient. These are just a few of the characteristics of God that he revealed here in his nature, in Christ's nature, as he writes to his friends at Smyrna. And we'll see the purpose for those in a few moments. Then it tells us what he knows. It tells us what he knows about the believers in Smyrna. And he has some interesting comments to make about them. We read in verse number 9, he said, I know your works. They work very hard for Christ for his honor and his glory facing great difficulty and we read some of the difficulties there it says in tribulation in the midst of poverty these were not rich people these were poor people they were lived in poverty and then it says that they endured the blasphemy of people around them who said they were believers and they weren't it's described this way he said he said, I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. There were people around the city, and perhaps even in the congregation of believers in Smyrna, who professed that they were believers and followers of Christ, but they were not. They were fakes. They were professors. They professed that they believed, but in reality they did not. And in fact, Jesus describes them in a very strong terms. He said they belonged to the synagogue of Satan. They were worse than those who came along and pretended to have a good life and live a good life. Jesus called them members of the congregation and the synagogue of Satan. And then we read after Jesus gives some commendation to the believers in Smyrna. He then outlines for them something they probably didn't want to hear. He says, you're going to face some difficulties yet ahead. And in fact, we read in verse number 10, it says, Fear none of those things which you shall suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried, and you'll have tribulation ten days. But be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Jesus here warns them ahead of time. You think it's difficult now, more difficulties face you in the future. And in fact, some of you will be cast into prison. And the devil will take your life. And there will be times when persecution will become difficult. And it will cause death to come. But he said, don't fear those things. The time is limited. It's not going to be forever. It's a very short term. He uses the phrase, ten days we don't know whether there was a literal 10 days or whether that was a figurative time period that would be just a short period of time that they would endure these trials and difficulties. But Jesus, in the midst of commending them for their faithfulness and for their perseverance in the midst of poverty and tribulation and difficulty, he forewarns them that difficult times still lay ahead, but remain faithful. We read furthermore the reason why. Why did God send this message through Christ his Son? Why did he deliver it to them? What purpose and function did it play in the lives of believers of Smyrna? Well, first of all, it gave them instruction. It revealed to them who Jesus Christ was. And he gave them some very clear direction and explanation as to his nature. His deity He's eternal. He's omniscient. He's the Savior. He's the judge. And those things would encourage and comfort those believers in Smyrna as they endured the difficulties that came along their way. Furthermore, he encouraged them. He said, don't give up. Don't quit. Be faithful. You'll receive a crown of life. 
So what can we summarize about the commendation that Christ gave to these believers in Smyrna? Well, they were faithful. They persisted. They resisted the enemy, the devil, who conspired against them and brought false believers into their midst and tempted them with those hardships. And he told them, fear not. Don't be afraid. They didn't give in to the temptation to somehow give in to the culture about them and to the world about them, hoping that somehow that might change things. No, yielding to the culture would not have helped them. The culture was evil and satanic, it tells us. Furthermore, we notice that in the midst of all of this, he describes them as poor. <laughs> They're living in poverty. In other words, he was revealing to them that faithfulness to Christ does not bring financial reward necessarily. And to them it did not. They were faithful believers, but they lived in poverty. And furthermore, the fact that they were faithful to Christ did not bring immunity from difficulty and hardship. In fact, it was the very cause of their difficulty and hardship. So Christ wrote this letter to them, sent it by way of John, the Apostle John, to the believers at Smyrna, to encourage them, to commend them for their faith, to, to encourage them to press on in the midst of difficulty and hardship and to comfort them that it would only be a short time. It wouldn't last forever. Ten days, he said. Just a short time. Hang in there, in the language of our day. So we've re read here about the nature of Christ as revealed in this letter. We've read about the character of the people, the believers in the city of Smyrna. And we've read about the warning that Christ gave to them. Now we also see the reward. He promised them a reward. He said, if you remain faithful to the very end, even through death, you receive a crown of life. Now, theologians have disputed over the years whether that is a literal crown <laughs> that they would wear on their heads or whether that was a kind of a picture of eternal life. Either way, it bespeaks of a reward that Christ promised them for their faithfulness and perseverance under trial and difficulty. And we see confirmed a little later on in the next verse that in fact they would experience eternal life. So whether it is a picture or a literal crown, Christ promised them a reward for their faithfulness and their endurance under stress and hardship. And he describes it in this fashion. He said, if you're faithful unto death, you'll receive a crown of life. And then he says, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt by the second death. What's the second death? That's that death that many people who claim to be preachers of the gospel today refuse to discuss. That's hellfire. We read later on in the book of Revelation, when the judge, Christ, separates the sheep from the goats, the believers from the unbelievers, the unbelievers and the goats are cast into the fire that burns forever, and that is the second death. And Christ promised these believers, if they would remain faithful to him throughout their difficulties and, and the temptations and the persecution that would come their way, I'll give you the crown of life, and furthermore, you will not participate in the second death, but you will experience eternal life. Well, I'm sure as we've thought about these people in the city of Smyrna and wondered about them, what does that have to do with me? How does that correlate to our day and age today? We kind of have the phrase very popular today, don't we? What's in it for me? What do I get out of this? Well, there is a very strong correlation between the message that Christ gave to the believers in Smyrna and our day today. Everything that was true then 
is true now. We encounter worldwide persecution of believers and Christ followers. We see worldwide imprisonment. We see people all throughout the world in various lands, some places where you wouldn't even suspect it. Believers thrown into prison and suffer great difficulty and hardship because of their faith in Christ. And it's hard for us to understand these things as to why Christ would allow them to happen. But they do. And they've happened throughout history. But we have the promises and the assurance that Christ gave to those believers in Smyrna that we have for us today as well. We have an idea, a concept, an understanding. We have a knowledge of who Christ is. And he's the same today, yesterday, and forever. And what he said about himself to those believers that we read in verses 8 and 9 about the fact that he was the beginning and the end, he was dead and came to life again, he said, I know those same things are true about Christ today. He is still deity. He is still eternal in his life. He still is going to be the judge. He still is the Savior. He still is omniscient. He knows your circumstances and mine, and he understands. And he would encourage us as he encouraged them, remain faithful. It's hard, I know. It's difficult, but it's only going to be a short time. Your life is but a breath, the scriptures tell us. Hang in there, is the message. Don't quit. Remain faithful. And to those who overcome, they'll receive a crown of life. And they will not experience the second death. That promise holds true for believers today, as well as believers in that first century in the city of Smyrna. So those same truths that Christ gave to the believers in Smyrna, we can also hold on to in our day and age. They can encourage us and they can comfort us as well as it did those believers. Well, how will you respond? What are the implications that these truths have upon your life and upon mine? Let's presume for the moment that you are a believer. You are a follower of Christ. Is it difficult? Facing hardship? Facing trial and temptation? Facing from time to time the attack of the enemy, the devil, who would want to disrupt and interfere in your life? Those trials come. They came to those believers, and they come in our day as well. I would encourage you with the same message that Christ gave to those believers in Smyrna. Be faithful to the end. Trust Christ. His nature and character has not changed over the years. He still is the eternal one. He still is the one who is dead and is now alive. He is the Savior. He will be the judge. And he is aware of your circumstances and is aware of your life. And he knows your circumstances. And you can find encouragement from him. I would encourage you, as Christ did those believers, remain faithful. Trust Christ in the midst of your difficulty and hardship and your trials. In poverty, yes, sometimes. Facing imprisonment, yes. Yes, even in those days, in those times, Christ can provide comfort and encouragement and enable you to endure difficulty, as he says, for a short time. Well, let's presume for a moment that you are not a believer. You are not a Christ follower. In fact, all of your life has been marked by your resistance to God and to Christ and anything having to do with Christianity or Christ or the Bible. You've had no interest whatsoever in pursuing it or looking at it or having anyone discuss it with you. Well, I'm not surprised. That's how sinners act. We are born with a sinful nature. We are born that way. We are born with a repulsion of God. The scriptures call us enemies of God. That's how we're born. That's how I was born. That's how everyone from Adam and Eve, since Adam and Eve, that's how everyone since them have been born in sin. Have no interest in God, have no interest in Christ. But you're still here. 
you're still watching. God in his sovereignty has enabled you, given you the interest and the desire to see, well, what's this guy got to say? I want to see what he's going to bring about in the conclusion. Well, here's God's word to you. God's word to you is that he has provided a substitute for you. Because you are completely unable, you don't have any desire to bridge the gap between you and God. And it exists. It's there. There is a separation because of your sin. And you don't want to go there. You can't. You may have even tried to reform your life. And that's difficult, isn't it? It's impossible. The Christian life isn't difficult. It's impossible. It's only something that the divine activity in your life can produce. God's message to you, he's provided a substitute. His son, his only son, he gave his son as a substitute on behalf of people like you and me. Sinners like us. He lived a perfect life. He did not sin. He did not lie, cheat, steal, or commit immorality in mind or in act. Because of his life, he could die the death that he died, which was a substitutionary death. He died on behalf of other people, not because of his own sin. And God the Father accepted that sacrifice on behalf of people like you and like me. And the scriptures tell us, Jesus himself has said, Everyone who comes to God the Father through faith in me, he will accept. God will forgive. He will pardon. He will make a child of God. He will even send his very nature to live and reside within them, enabling them to live that life which they cannot live on their own, that requires divine power within them. I pray that the Spirit of God will come to you today, will give to you that new life, that divine life, that life that only God himself can provide, and that he will enable you to believe and trust Christ for yourself as your substitute, as the one who died in your behalf to cover the sin that you have committed throughout your life. And you will find that God will pardon you, forgive you, reconcile you to himself, Bridge the chasm that exists between you and God and make you, adopt you as his child and will enable you to face and endure the difficulty and hardships that will come your way throughout the rest of your life. And when you remain faithful as he will enable you to live, you will receive a crown of life. You will not participate in that second death that comes to all those who reject Christ and refuse the offer that God has made available through faith in Christ. I pray that the Spirit of God will come to you today and give to you that new life in Him that will change you, transform you, make you into a child of God, enable you to live free from the world and its temptations, that will enable you to resist and stand against the devil and live victoriously over his taunts and his oppression. I pray that the Spirit of God will come to you today and give you this new life.